final uh, session this afternoon, um, the emerging expulsion logic on where does it leave uh, democracy. Our speaker for this panel um, needs very little introduction. It's Saskia Sasson, who is the Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University. Um, Saskia's work predominantly focuses on globalization, immigration, and global cities. Uh, and Saskia is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Academy of Sciences panel on cities. Um, Saskia will be following the um, same format that we had for the previous session, speaking for 20, 30 minutes. And then we will have our discussants, um, Gina Suneth and Charlotte Steinhoff, who will, I will introduce when Saskia has finished her presentation. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. It's an enormous pleasure to be here. Is this artificial or real light? <laughs> real so the light doesn't change in budapest i mean in most places you know at some point it would be dark but no i have been marveling about this anyhow this just to say how beautiful this space is and how happy i am to be here um, a lot of good things were said most good things were probably already said um, so i'm going to tell a slightly darker story than you have heard up till now um, i think that we are entering an epoch, we're probably already in it in some parts of the world, where the categories, the critical categories we have, the main categories we have used to explain, you know, social organization, political systems, are perhaps less useful than they used to be. No category is permanently useful. You know, history moves on. Kingdoms have fallen, corporations have died, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why should those categories matter? I'm right now writing something about what we are calling the migrations that are happening in the Mediterranean, in the sea of Indonesia. I don't think we can call that migration. I don't think that is the search for a better life. That is the search for bare life, the basics of life. So that is clearly a very, very dramatic uh, case. What I want to talk about is something that really has to do with a minor part of the systemics that we're living through. It's not the major part, it's a minor part. One starting point to put it on the table is to say that the discussion on inequality, which has really taken off, and I'm delighted that it has, good as it is, important as it is, much that it captures, is not enough, I think, to describe some very extreme trends. In a way, inequality is a distribution. Further, we've always had it. So you need to interpolate that category, inequality, that distribution. So you can make all kinds of arguments and then make it work further than just being a distribution. Any complex system it's going to have inequalities. It's almost inevitable. Otherwise, we would just be, you know, a plain topos where nothing really moves. So for me, the question on the one hand is, yes, we must capture that. I've been working on that subject for a very, very long time when mostly people thought there is no problem of that sort. So what I want to emphasize is that, um, and, and let me s sort of give, uh, well, I'll give several examples, but for now, let me just say that I think that at some point, and let's take very simple facts that we're all familiar with, unemployment, for instance. At some point, the very, very, very long-term unemployed are no longer captured with our existing categories. They just, they, our, our categories, our statistics don't capture them. If somebody has been unemployed for 10 years, that person disappears. And so I use this, and that is just one example. Another is sort of to go to the other extreme. I use the case of dead land and dead water. We have a lot of it. We made that. I always like to say that. And when you stand back, you can make a very interesting argument, and that is that the polity, the economy, the society of many of our countries doesn't quite cover the full 
territorial unit as recognized in international law because vast parts of it are wrecked, dead land and dead water, just to mention two. So that, again, is an interesting sort of set of phenomena that we sort of, we disappear them. We don't talk about it. There's no, no, why should you go there? One of the arguments that I make sometimes, partly as a provocation, but only partly, is we should capture, measure all the dead land and all the dead water we have in our countries. We should have a map that is shown in kindergarten so that people, kids know, ah, yeah, dead land, dead water. And if I want to push it further, I would say we should make it a jurisdiction because then it's a systematicity that we can recognize. Back to what we miss, what disappears, etc in a more general sense, I argue that one way of looking at it is a multiplication of systemic edges inside our territorial units. This is not about the interstate system. This is not about the borders of the interstate system. These, these are histories and geographies that we're making inside our countries. They acquire a kind of global uh, uh, character because they recur. Through recurrence, a whole set of globalities are getting generated. But it does not necessarily have to do with movement across. I just want to emphasize that. The systemic edge, then, is that point in a process. And I want to emphasize a familiar process, an everyday process, not a monster, not that which is strange, which comes from another planet, the familiar, the quotidian, when that takes on such an extreme form that we lose it conceptually, statistically, and probably visually, no matter how material it is. I mean, think, when was the last time that you went to visit a huge patch of dead land? We just don't do that. Though I bet you we will have tourism because some of that landscape is extraordinarily dramatic. I like to show some of the, like the, the RLC, which we managed to reduce to a little, little patch of water. Billions of cubic water eliminated, destroyed in 20 years. It's worthwhile going there. You know, but we, we just don't. Anyhow, so these systemic edges. Now, um, the, the, the second element that comes out of this kind of formulation, out of this mode of thinking and theorizing and actually generating questions for empirical research, um, is, is the, the sort of the proposition, I would say, that we need to de-theorize, go back to ground level, strip the theorization. By the way, it's impossible to do. But it's a project, huh? so never perfectly possibly implement it. We can't. If we were not theoretical in our way of experiencing, when I walk into this room, I would go crazy if I saw everything. So in that sense, if you think of theoria as seeing, you know, that other way of seeing. When you walk in here, if you didn't already have mental categories for organizing the visual space, the visual, uh, to organize the space visually, you would be still standing there trying to take it all in. So when I say de-theorize, I mean it partly as a projectual, you know, as a, as a move, as work. I do not mean a perfect execution. I don't think that is possible. So anyhow, we need to de-theorize go back to ground level in order to re-theorize. And by re-theorize, I mean a certain sort of element of great complexity in the story. Huh? Um, so so um, when, I, when I mentioned the case of the migrants in the Mediterranean, etc., and I said, we can't call this migrant we need another term if we really want to capture the specificity. And I say it's the search for bare life, the basics of life. You know, that is a way, it's at a fairly low level, clearly, but it's a way of re-theorizing 
something. The migration literature, the law on migration, the signed treaties, the signed but not respected treaties, there is a whole set of language about migration. It does not capture what we are seeing. I mean, some of them are migrants, but you mean the most dramatic cases. So I just want to use that as an example. Now, to do the kind of work that I do, and I must say that this for me is a bit exposed, and this is not how I started out. I realize I've been doing this for 30 years, this way of interpolating continuously the existing explanation, the existing category. Um, but I've come to, to, to think about it in, in a, I just try to make it a bit more elegant. So I call it the zone before method, not after method. You know there is a famous book, After Method. So before method, and basically what it is, it's sort of the possibility, the freedom to position myself, the researcher to position herself, vis-a-vis -vis the object of study, in whatever way I want. So before method. Eventually the disciplining of method sets in. But then I engage method armed with a few items that come out of the before method. So one way of thinking about it, especially since I sort of really move in different types of domains, is that it is the fuzzy edges of paradigmatic knowledge where I want to go digging I don't want to go to the heart of the paradigm. The heart of the paradigm is strong. It stays strong. It matters. I'm not throwing it out of the window. Some of my students totally misunderstand what I'm talking about and say, oh, I'll just throw it out of the window. No, you don't do that with a paradigm. But positioning yourself where the paradigm loses traction, where it gets fuzzy, and especially positioning yourself between paradigms. Like I continue because I have a PhD in economics and in sociology, and I also studied philosophy. So I'm a mess, right? But when I give it that pretty language, the fuzzy edges of paradigmatic knowledge is the zone where I go digging and do my research. You know, it sounds like a project rather than madness, I hope. Now here are some of the sort of analytic tactics that I like to use. So one is, uh, to sort of destabilize, actively destabilize stable meanings. The state, the economy, the middle classes, the environment, these are all today unstable meanings. The stability in the meaning still matters, but I want to destabilize it a bit. That's all. I want to do that actively. When I speak about the state, to, today I was thinking in these excellent discussions that we have had, uh, when people talk about the state, the state. For me, the liberal state, beginning in the 1980s, begins to develop a very, this is just an illustration, begins to develop a very strong tendency to see with the eye of corporate logics. It isn't simply that it is fraudulent. It really understands the executive branch of government, the, the minister of finance, it's the central bank. They begin to adopt the logic of large corporations, not completely, but partly. So when I say the state today, I'm talking about a different, partly at least, element in the picture than the state during the Keynesian period, if we just think about that in very loose terms, you know, after World War II. Same thing with the middle classes. The middle class today is a different concept from what is the middle class after World War II, when it is the growing class, when it becomes a historic actor of sorts. Today, its historicalness, if that is English, resides in the fact that it makes visible, like no other class makes visible, impoverishment. Well, that's a very different function for the middle class as category for analysis than it was after World War II, when it reflects growth. It reflects a kind of new economy. Um, now, in the shadows of powerful explanations is another of these analytic tactics, you know, which uh, a powerful explanation, again, cannot be thrown out of the window, but you can ask, what don't I see when I invoke this powerful explanation? And that's the beginning, again, of a project. 
I'm not saying solution. I'm not saying answers to everything. So quite a few of the terms that were mentioned today about liberal democracy, etc. My question immediately, my mind just works that way, is when I say liberal democracy, what don't I see? I mean, to me, these are absolutely necessary questions that we must ask. Now, again, it doesn't mean that it's liberal democracy is a concept full of meaning, rich. It is shorthand for a vast amount of things. It's extremely useful, extremely necessary. But that still does not preclude that you can interrogate it. Huh? And of course, we also need a few new categories. Now, to me, what has really returned with a vengeance is the category territory, which, which first, let me just give you my quick definition. Territory is not simply land, it's not earth, it's not space, it's not terrain. It is actually a very complex condition that is only partly material, in other words, land, that has embedded logics of power, embedded logics of claim making, citizenship, the working state. Um, but it has sort of taken a very long analytic siesta because it has adopted, acquired, and not fought back as a category one singular meaning, which is national sovereign territory. And so my question there is, again, I don't want to throw it out. I just want to ask, what do I see when I allow territory to adopt many more meanings than national sovereign territory. So for instance, when I was doing the work on the global city, that is a kind of territory. The same thing now, today, uh, I'm working, I'm, I'm very sort of um, interested in detecting new geographies of centrality that cut across established divisions, east, west, north, south, that are partial, that encompass only parts of national territories and they are endowed with all kinds of infrastructures that are great, with possibilities that are great, and they can leave out vast stretches of a country's land. You see that a bit in the United States. The last addition, the latest, not the last, the latest addition to this geography of centrality, in, in I mean, one of them at least, is Luanda. Poor city, doesn't have proper hotels, it has become the most expensive city, according to those rankings that they do, uh, for, say, foreign professionals, etc. It is a boom town right now. Predatory elite in that country, devastated population, but lots of wealth. All it takes is construct that platform that is Luanda, give it everything it needs, and the rest you can forget. Another good example of a big difference is uh, if you take the empires you know, of the 1800s and the 1700s, in shorthand, one might say that Britain wanted the whole of Africa, and some, of course, Spain wanted the whole of Latin America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, that is not the mode. Today, you go, get the land, set up a plantation. When the land dies, which will be much faster because it isn't made into a plantation, they're out of there. Zero interest. And so you have more and more dead land. There is no interest in taking care of a whole country. I'm not trying to say that the, that, the, that the older imperial modes were kinder than this. I'm just saying it's a totally different pattern. And so the territory that we're talking about is a strategic zone that is built up, that is endowed with all kinds of capacities, and that is what matters. And when you're finished with that, Oh, you don't care anymore. You can leave it behind. And we see national governments do that. This is not just sort of international. It's not the usual story. China goes, buys big plantation. Then when it's done, it's done, it's out. No. In fact, China actually builds hospitals because it wants its workers. Uh, and the workers can't handle the climate. You know, these are very ironic little endowments of a terrain uh, that has an additional purpose. And then finally, I mean, one thing that sort of to bring it down to ground level for me is this notion of capturing the fact that we make it. We make inequality. We make justice. These are not natural orders. 
I mean, the way they, in their full complexity, in some sense, you say inequality is almost inevitable, I just said at the beginning, but still the particularities, the modes through which inequality gets constituted, we make it. Now, I use this as a, as a flashlight. If I say we make it, I have to look not at outcomes, not at just the statistics. I have to see how did we get there. And in some cases, everything has to do with wages, for instance. We have quite a bit of information. And the whole debate about inequality has been extraordinarily helpful in producing that data. But there is much more that we make and that we should be uh, trying to you know, revisit a lot of our knowledge in terms of how did it actually get constituted. And so today, when I talk about expulsions, that is part of the story for me. We made that, extreme, that familiar condition into an extreme, at one end, extreme condition that we can no longer capture with our And so, you know, and, and, and again, there is a lot of information, both from economists, you know, empirical economists, and from sociologists that demonstrate how a lot of these things were made. Now, I want to move very quickly and to sort of gain a more synthetic uh, vista of what I'm talking about. And so one way of, of asking it is, what is the steam engine of our epoch? The steam engine had the power to directly or indirectly transform, but it was not everywhere. It was not like, say, digital infrastructure today, which is everywhere. It's a very different modality. So, so people actually, typically, when I get a chance to sort of speak with them, they will say, oh, digital, the digital technology is the steam. And so I, I partly agree, but partly I disagree for the reason I just said. So, so one, one sort of to nail down the question, you know, this is a question about making also, that which can make a new ordering. And again, a new ordering doesn't mean transform everything. I must say, oh, this reminds me that I have a book here that I brought for, for here, but in, my, in what I think is my best book, Territory Authority Rights, one of the questions that I asked was how do complex systems change? And they do not simply change by erasure, like the Roman Empire began to change long before it was sort of destroyed by, I say in quotation marks, the barbarians, as they were referred to. But I think very often one part, and that was the one that interested me the most, they change by shifting existing capabilities that were made for function A, B, whatever, to new organizing logics. The same capability begins to function differently. I have sort of explored that with a whole bunch of issues, but one example is the rule of law. In our Western history, the question of the rule of law emerges when these emergent nation states want to legitimate themselves. And so today, the rule of law has lots, of, a, a whole set of components of the rule of law have shifted organizing logic. So the deal, it's the opposite, almost. Deregulating, privatizing, corporatizing, the TT, you know, the, the, these disastrous trade treaties that are being signed, they are also invoking the rule of law. And they're invoking some of the same principles, but the organizing logic within which those, capabil those legal capabilities function are totally different. So then you begin to actually be able, looking like that, you begin to be able to pick out transformations that might be dressed in familiar clothing, but that are functioning differently. And that is why at the beginning I emphasized the familiar that becomes so extreme that we cannot capture it conceptually or statistically. And so that systemic edge I call expulsion. But before I forget, I brought this book. Um, you will decide to whom it goes. This is the book that I was just referring to. I have it here and I just forgot about it. Um, now, so to answer to this question for me is finance. Really the capacity to financialize. Something radically different from banking. And I like to sort of quick, dirty differentiation. The traditional bank sells something it has, money, 
They literally have money. The financial firm sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have lies both its creativity, you know, the algorithmic math, amazing inventions, amazing instruments they have to make that. Why do we have to make it? Because they have to invade other sectors in order to get the grist for their mill. So radically different. In other words, traditional banking, we all need it. I really believe in traditional banking. Not that they are nice people always, but you know, we need loans. Do we need finance? Mm. We need it if we can bring it down, materialize it, because few sectors, in my reading, no other sector can jump orders of magnitude the way high finance has been able in these last 20 years. So finance makes capital. It's, you know, Marx would really call it fictive capital. But my question is, can we bring it, when it's up there, all that trillions and trillions and trillions, can we bring it down and materialize it into whatever, green transport, social housing, whatever it might be? Very difficult. It's so powerful, it cannot even govern itself. The velocities are such that, forget it, now you have complaints from top-level financiers that the computers are cheating. Because you know a lot of this stuff is super the hyper frequent hyper frequent tra frequency trading, and the computer is detecting little possibilities that the brilliant physicists who sit now in the back room, what used to be the room for the secretaries, huh? hundreds of physicists in these financial firms, developing these algorithms, the financiers, not the physicists, say, my God, the computer is cheating. They have discovered something that is working against me that is not in my, you know, I mean, these are extraordinary. Now, I want to show you a, a graph. All that matters here is the temporal 201 and here 207. In other words, when the crisis really takes off and the sharpness of the curve. This is a growth from under a trillion. Now, I know in Europe the, the zeros are a bit different, but you know, trillion, trillion is, I don't know how you say it, but you have a different term in Europe. Um, and it reaches 62 trillion. Think of anything. Really, I'm inviting you to think. You don't have to give an answer, but not now. But think of anything that can jump orders of magnitude at that speed. Not multiplication of bacteria that re re replicate very fast. I've checked out nothing. This is absolutely a form of making. And it could not be done with the tools of traditional banking. In that sense, radically different. Now, I want to just emphasize a few things. Besides this amazing growth from less than a trillion to 62 trillion, these 62 trillion are more in 2007 than the global GDP of all countries which was 54 trillion. That actually is not such a special datum because finance can easily transcend a country's GDP. But those 62 trillion of finance were 10% of the global value of finance as measured by outstanding derivatives, which is a typical measure. That gives you a sense also of an order of magnitude. You understand what I'm saying? It was 630 trillion. I mean, when global GDP was 54 trillion. So again, so this is a capability. And I mean capability clearly not in the Amartya sen sense where it's only positive. I find it very difficult to say that a given capability is positive and will stay that way. I, I see a lot of what I just was saying. It can jump organizing logics and become very negative. So. When I say capability, I, I mean it without a, necess a necessary positive sort of connotation. Now, this is, this is another interesting thing that sooner or later we have to deal with. So these are dark pools. When, when, um, when this is where most of the private financial trading is taking place. Most trading is private, and most of it increasingly is in these dark pools. And Europe often thinks it is so different, Europe has it too. Now, when Bernanke, our former head of central bank, retired uh, in 2014, he gave a very long list of items, and he said, and then there are the dark pools, and we don't know what is happening there. We know, for instance, I do research about all of this, we know that there is a whole bunch of very fancy bank bankers, say on Wall Street and in London, who want to become part of some of these pools. And they often said no. 
So these are very private, but there are many. This is multiplication. You see the figures there, right? Um, but again, these, these have, I mean, I have written about it in my expulsions book, what are the properties of these dark pools. They are very interesting from the perspective of how finance works, but we don't need to dwell on that. So one, so I said, a new ordering that generates what is in and what is out, you know, that changes. Well, let me just focus on what is out. But there is also what is in, all right? I don't want to, but what is out? So one element, and here I'm trying to, given time, I'm trying to bring two extremes in the same zone for just a bit of time. There is clearly a temporality here. It is not, you know, just endless. And so that is high finance develops a brilliant instrument that is also uh, in Italian, micidiale. I can't think of the English word now, but that is a killer tool. So it's extraordinarily brilliantly designed. 16 very complex steps. Again, the math of physicists, not the math of microeconomics. Microeconomics doesn't play a role in this. Zero. Microeconomics is a safe zone. It, less and less danger there, except when economists propose policies based on some microeconomics. This is a totally different story. So what is out, and you're familiar with this, I just want to emphasize two things here. One is that I'm taking a very powerful financial sector. This is mostly Wall Street. And the most modest households in the United States. The tool is aimed at producing an asset-backed security as opposed to a derivative based on an interest rate, based on another, you know, endless chains. Capital owners say at some point, okay, give me some asset-backed security, something that is actually not simply a derivative, right? You understand what I'm saying? The only sort of, a lot of stuff has already been financialized. What is left over, the mortgage always has functioned with great support from the government, et cetera, in the United States. And there were 30% of, of the households in the US who don't own a house. So of course they became primary destinations. It has the name of something that suggests we're helping the poor get housing. It has nothing to do. And so the data, that we have that comes from the central bank, here from the Fed, this is not my data, is that to make this work, they had to get households to sign. All they needed was a signature. And they were told, oh, just sign on. You don't have to pay anything for the next five years, six years, whatever. Just sign. All they needed was a signature. Each agent had to get at least 500 in a week. Otherwise, it wasn't, you know, the things were there. According to the central bank, over 14 million of these contracts were signed in a period of seven years. The highest point is even less than seven years. So, so you, 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 this was an army of people who said, sign, you can do it. The outcome is, of course, a crisis. They overdid it. Huh? Finance does not govern itself well. At the other end, the miseries of these people. So here you have every year, these are foreclosures. Foreclosure is simply a, a notice. According again to Bernanke, he said it when he stepped down and the data are there in the central bank. I always tell my students, by the way, go to the website of the central bank of your country. They are because central banks collect data and you find some very good data and we pay for those data. I say the same thing about the IMF, by the way. It's our data, you can cite it. I, I work a lot with IMF data too. Anyhow, these are millions. Most of these wind up losing their homes. It goes on, still the first half. The, the, the instrument was declared illegal around 207, but the history continues partly because you know of how it is. So, if 14 million, it's really closer evidently to 15 million households lost their home, that can be up to 30 million people. I'm Dutch. My country has 15 million people, maybe 16 million. That is like telling the population of the Netherlands, I don't care where you go, but you're out. Just go. And now we're going to try it again, just as a routine. I mean, these are amazing numbers. 
the materiality represented by all of this, the spaces now, the empty neighborhoods with all these houses, the people themselves, how they sort of wiggled themselves out. Some of them are homeless, etc. At one point, the biggest homeless camp, they just have uh, eliminated it, was in Silicon Valley. I have video of it that shows, and they had great sneakers and great bikes, a lot of young people, a lot of young men, and they probably had done a mortgage or thought that they had the money, and then they were out. And, and in Silicon Valley, if you stood on top of the hill, all you saw were the beautiful trees. If you came to the bottom of the hill, you saw this encampment. And it was quite amazing uh, to, you know, this was totally different from the image that we have of homeless. Um, now, Europe thinks it doesn't have this problem. It does. Oh, I'm sorry, here, is, here you see the graph. Let me just move on. So Hungary, you, some of you must know this, is very high. The estimate is that a million households in Hungary are in trouble and many of them have lost their homes. Germany is among the high level foreclosures. The numbers are small. By the way, these are numbers of households. A household could be seven people, one person, you know, it's highly variable. And I repeat, a foreclosure is not an eviction notice. It is just an alert. Huh? Watch out, watch out, you have to pay. Many of these people, so in Germany, you know, every year, you, you can see 91,000, actually data goes on, you know, 88,000, that, that is a million people. You understand? Invisible. If I speak in Germany with people, they don't know that. I assume that, I assume that in Hungary here you knew this or not. I mean, you don't have to expose your lack of knowledge about it right now. But so, so, and also the United Kingdom. And I also like, you know, a country, nice countries, Denmark, the Netherlands. <laughs> They also have that. Now, the sourcing of this, you know, one has to really go in there, check out the, the details, etc. Here is a bridge, debt. A bridge that the banking system, the financial system has into every household, powerful or poor, doesn't matter. Debt is a bridge. That, by the way, as footnote, I now think that for certain, I'm part of a group based in the Netherlands actually on, on currencies, local currencies, not, not Bitcoin. Uh, because if you circulate your own currency, a kind of extraction does not happen. But anyhow, there's another story. But what I want to emphasize here is, let's just look, first the title. Ratio, this, this by the way is IMF staff papers. IMF staff papers are very good papers, they don't get published, but we can use them. Remember, it's our data, we pay for it. And you have to cite it, of course, right? So anyhow, ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. These are critical years, by the way. These are the new history is made here, eh? 2000 to 2005. Now, household credit, that's debt. Credit sounds so good, you know, oh God, I have to spend it. And personal disposable income, like, so look Hungary, 2000. 11.2, very low. Look at the United States, already over 100. Huh? Five years later, almost 40%. That's quite amazing. And you know, you have, I have all kinds of countries. The United States is, of course, well over 130. You, you see where I'm going here, right? But, but the rate of growth is much slower. Now, here is what I, I keep interrogating data. I, I am continuously interrogating whatever the datum. So the datum that I interrogate here, besides the credit sounds so good and it's really a debt uh, and that it is a bridge, is um, who owns this household debt? These are households, remember, these are not firms. Huh? So if a local bank owns that debt, the, the interest paying cons a capacity of a locality actually recirculates, chances are, in the locality. Certainly, if you, if you have a local bank that is sort of a, also a part of a collective project, if it is an international bank, who knows where your interest payment capacity winds up? It may not at all recirculate, right, in the... So here, again, I went digging into the IMF staff papers. Look at Hungary, 40% is foreign owned. And if you go digging into these texts, Swiss, German, and Austrian are the leading owners of that debt. That is not so good. 
You understand what I'm saying, right? And again, all these data you can just check for any kind of country almost. Now, the picture that I have described in terms of the mortgage is a, is a picture that begins to empty urban land, right? Remember the 14.5 the million uh, households that have left there, and you have all these houses. I mean, it, it's an amazing sight. Most people don't, don't have an idea of what it looks like in the US because they don't go there. Why would you go there, right? But when you go, it is really astounding. Now, so I have become very interested in thinking of a lot of what goes under the title of buying a house, buying property, whatever, as an engagement with urban land. You don't buy urban land just as land, really. But you buy buildings that sit on urban land. And so I just want to run very quickly through two things. So inventing an urban land market. This is an invented market, totally invented market. It's an arrangement. It's like, you know the Nobel Prize winner who won it for matched markets? This is a matched market. I don't know if people, anyhow. It's an invented, it's a made market. This has nothing to do with whatever the economics. So here are minimum prices. Huh? These are minimum prices. And of course, it creates a whole zone. And there is so much available capital. By the way, most of those properties are like 100 million or 200 million, very rarely. But anyhow, they sort of, you know, they started out three years ago, four years ago. And um, you can also see the different nationalities. So I'm just giving you the top. I participated. The FT did a very good story on this. and I. Uh, was one of the people there. So here you have very, see Dubai, you have rich Africans, far more than you would have, have say, in, in Monaco. Then there is Paris, Moscow is, the, the base is typically cheap, uh, unusually cheap. And then you have, I love this one, Shanghai, 6.4 million, very difficult to find nowadays. Eh? And look at all the nationalities the world wants to buy in Shanghai. Look at Hong Kong. 15.4 million the minimum, and most of the buyers are mainland Chinese. I don't know if you, I find that a very comic sort of juxtaposition, but anyhow. Now here's another story. So this is a project that I'm doing now that I call Who Owns the City? Clearly nobody really owns a city. It's, it's a, this is a data set that it has been made by a whole bunch of entities from the World Economic Forum to Oxford Analytics, et cetera, et cetera. This is one year. This is not developing sites, eh, because that's a whole other story. This is property. Could be homes, uh, could be residential, could be business. But anyhow, it takes off in 208. Why? There is a crisis. This is a safe investment, et cetera, et cetera. So New York is number one. It loves that position. This is in one year, OK, this amount of money. 55 billion. London second, don't you have a whole, and so the 100 cities cover quite, I can't show you because it is too much. But, and this is one year, huh? Uh, and here you can see that there are leading cities and then it sort of dribbles down, you have 100 cities. If you look at foreign, London is at the top. I really don't think that foreign versus national is the critical variable here. The critical variable is that it is corporate. And and that the minimum thing is about $5 million in New York standards. So those, those are going to vary according to different positions. Now, th this past year, this year, 2013 to 2014, uh, it almost, uh, almost a trillion dollars went into buying. That's just one year. And they're literally buying properties that often are dark at night, nobody's occupying them. They are building new things too, and I go at night in New York and I check these new, very fancy luxury residential, dark. Some people who live in those say, they complain, they say, this is totally empty, this building. So they're sort of hanging in there. But in the meantime, and this is the critical point for me, in the meantime, they create mega projects that eliminate urban tissue, little street, little this, little that, one big mega project that is private. When I, when I uh, do sort of research about city, I have to find a definition of the city that is not the city is the city. So I say the city is a complex but incomplete system. And, and in that complexity and incomplete, that mix of complexity and incompleteness, lies the capacities of cities to 
have very long lives, outlive powerful corporations, powerful governments, kingdoms, etc. Extraordinary. And then when I really want to sort of hit the ground and say, why do these mega projects matter? They add density, and we tend to think our density is city, etc. And sort of my bottom line there is that historically, cities, real cities, not just little towns, have been places where those without power have made a history, have made a politics, have made a culture, have shaped the outcome of significant policies. Think about public transport, public health, et cetera, public schooling, et cetera, et cetera. When you have a mega project, you privatize urban tissue. And that also brings up the question of density. Density is not enough to mark a city. An office park is extremely dense, but the powerless are not going to make a history there. They go there and clean or whatever, and then they're out. So I see a massive transformation afoot. And right now, urban land becomes this precious resource in the same way that rural land. I have, and I, I can't, um, I can't show the slides on rural land, but I, that is also in Expulsion's book. You know, vast stretches of land are being bought up f to get at water, to get at minerals, and to get at earth to grow basically plantation crops. These are massive transformations. When I look at the migrants, the so-called migrants, many of them are being expelled. And we know that they go first to big cities, and then there might be war or whatever. But they are really in search of life, period, because they're being thrown out of so many other places. Now, one question that, that sort of, I, did I talk far too long already? Oh my god, I just see the clock. She put this wonderful big clock for me there, and I wasn't looking at it. So I'm going to make this very quickly. So one, one way of summarizing it is that I see a new systemics. And one chart that I like to show, I have been in Athens debating with the Minister of Economy, et cetera, you know about. Um, and look at this. All countries were hit, right? You see what I'm saying? Athens is not on here, but you know, all were hit. Germany recovers, though now it is stagnant, we know that, right? Because of, it has the ultimate intermediate manufacturing sector, machines that make machines, the whole world needs them. The manufacturing is a distributed sector, multipolar, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, it has a lot of traditional banking, much more than the US. The US killed 10,000 banks in about five years because of the financializing. Now, all the other countries, they're going down too. So the argument that I make vis-a-vis -vis Greece, this is really a footnote, is Greece is the extreme version partly because of tax evasion by the, the oligarch, as they are called even by the Financial Times, and by Angela Merkel, by the way. Uh, but this is a deeper systemic condition that all these countries are suffering. So I think that matters. Um, I think I should stop. I, these are all totally interesting graphs, but I just have to stop. I just wanted to end with uh, these telltales. These are I love these one lines, they tell tales. I wanted to end with, oh no, I'm not going to do this. Oh my God, imagine all I was going to do. <laughs> I want to end with this slide, unstable meanings. And I, I think that a lot of what I'm talking about in these extreme expulsions, etc., raises a question. We need to revisit the question, who are we, the citizens? Because so many citizens are out, out of the picture. And the fact that they become invisible is extremely disturbing. But finally, and I leave this to stimulate your imagination, it's taking off in Europe too. How many people have seen this map? Anyhow, 10,000 buildings, full-time, year-round, 24 hours, gathering information about all of us. If you have been in New York or anywhere in the US, you're probably in there. Uh, the logic of the system is ridiculous. The logic is we gather information on all of you because prima facie, you are suspect. This is the logic. They don't put it that way. But the logic is you are suspect, and then we can establish whether you're not. Operationally, ground level, good old prejudice rules. They'll find a, they don't find people that way. 
They find the people on the street, Muslim, whatever, you know, suspicious, bag, whatever. And then they go check the database. It is absolutely ridiculous. And you know that France, maybe Hungary not, France, Germany, the Netherlands, they all have it. Maybe not so extensive, but it's growing everywhere. So again, the question is, who are we, the citizens? When I hear speaking about democracy, etc., I cannot help but think, who is the rights-bearing subject? The very rich don't even need citizenship. They, you know, whatever. The new trade agreements establish that justice will be delivered by the lawyers of the corporations. No state can intervene. What are we talking about? So when I, when I look at the question of democracy and the stuff that we're talking about, yes, there is a core that is absolutely working, and I'm very grateful for it. But there is so much that is falling apart. Honks of the democratic project are falling. Then you take a long historical thing. No, uh, uh, Vista, no system of power has lasted forever. I don't know that what we call liberal democracy, as we have known it, there might be totally different instantiations of it, that that can last. So I just put this not as a critique to the whole debate about democracy, but to interrogate. And interrogate is a positive practice. It's not a critique. Thank you very much. Big step. You okay? Thank you. Um, many thanks to Saskia. That was a wonderful presentation, slightly depressing presentation, but nonetheless wonderful. Should um, I keep the decor here <laughs> so nobody forgets, right? We, we have slightly overrun, and I'm very keen to get to uh, both of our discussants who are very excited about critiquing your work um, and discussing your work with you. So I'd just like to introduce, introduce, first of all, on my right is my colleague in the School of Public Policy, Gina Neff, who is Associate Professor. Gina is a specialist on media and communication, um, focusing on the social and organizational impact of new communication technology, and the author of an award-winning book, Venture Label, Work and the Burden of Risk in Innovative Industries. And to my left, we have Charlotte Steinorth, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Legal Studies. Um, Charlotte's focus is on human rights protection, global justice, and democratization. And Charlotte was formerly a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute. So I'm going to start with Gina um, for Gina's 10 minutes, and then we'll move on to Charlotte, OK? Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. I want to start by taking us to the Expulsions book. This is a beautiful beautiful book, and it captures many of the themes that you talked about today. It is a book that has a globe full of threads. <laughs> Much like today's talk, it weaves together globalization, financialization, migration, environmental degradation, and it is woven, stretched, these threads, almost, almost, but not quite to the point of breaking, but they are woven together deftly in this beautiful pattern that is clear. If there were a single book that we could read at the School of Public Policy, I would recommend this one. In fact, I'm willing to say that the founding graduating class should be given <laughs> copies of expulsions as their graduation present. Well, I won't oppose that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 your publisher. Um, and yet, here we sit in Budapest, in this gorgeous space, right? And we're in a city that was built to incorporate. Now, let me explain. In expulsions, Professor Sasson uses this metaphor of expulsion and incorporation to really talk about a change in the fundamental dynamics of what's going on. And you heard much of the evidence today. But this core metaphor is so powerful. Are states incorporating or are they expelling? Are they bringing citizens in to this greater sense of economic security, economic participation, s participation in, within the state, democratic participation, or are citizens being expelled? That word expulsion adds a very different light to migration, right? So, so 
that yeah, these, yeah. these are not migrants. Right. They're, 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 they're forced, they're being expelled out to seek a life, of, a, a bare life, in your phrase. So yeah, here we are, we're in Budapest. And this city was built to incorporate. This was an incorporating city. It is a city that was built to incorporate Croats, Serbs, Romanians. It's an imperial city that was built just as the empire faded. So Budapest has gone from being, if I may, the capital of the kingdom of Hungary, forgive me, um, this is heresy in some circles in this country, um, the capital of the kingdom of Hungary to, well, let's just be frank, it's the capital of European partying, but not at the School of Public Policy. Party, yes, yes. This beautiful, beautiful space is being reincorporated in a different sort of way. But this is happening, this explosion of what we see right now, right here in this city, of people seeking a gorgeous city, great urbanity, cheap rents, is happening at the same time that another kind of expulsion is happening, right? This lack of welcoming of many different types of people into the cosmopolitan democracy. So what's so exciting about this book is that it's a new theory of power. I think what you're really working on is a fundamental grand unified theory of power that brings these conceptualizations of globalization from above, from below, that we've stumbled over the terminology, we've stumbled through what we're doing, and, and really trying to, to reimagine and reconfigure what the power dynamic is and how we can perhaps stop it, or if not stop it, stem it, slow it. You're very clear, we have borders, yes. We have nation states, yes. But perhaps these fundamental dynamics of power are no longer beholden to these borders, that the border may actually be preventing us from seeing how the flows are happening. And this metaphor of expulsion and incorporation gives us the language to do just that. It allows us to see that borders are more porous for some people and less porous for others, right? Who are those people? Who are the incorporated? And who are the expelled? Professor Sasson called this um, expulsions book her little book, but it's, it's really full of very big ideas and I think big possibilities and opportunities. And, and, and essentially that you know, my, my kind of comments to the discussion are, you know, in this um, global system, you write that there's really everyday dynamics. The places where the expelling people from society and economy slows down a bit. We can see them right now. As you mentioned in your talk, we can take our flashlight and we can see that. And those places are first cities that cities may be our last best hope for being able to speak human power to different kinds of capitals, different forms of capital. And so these, these fudge, fuzzy edges of the global, these fuzzy edges of the, of the paradigm of globalization start to, start to break apart in their own capitals that the fuzzy edge of globalization really is about being in the global connected city, but being a person and being an incorporated person and being a person who incorporates others. So optimism was not the tone of today's talk and it's not the tone of the expulsions book, but I actually see hope I see hope in the, in, in the way you conclude today's talk, the way you conclude um, the expulsions book, um, about how to remake the, the fundamental relationship to financial power. And, and, and to push, I think, our discussion, and not to take up more of Charlotte's time, is, is to say, is 
is a new lens of thinking about citizenship in, a, in, a, in an age of expulsion and incorporation is our very concepts of citizenship and democracy now much more required to be tied firmly to place in a world in which global financial dynamics are pushing and thrusting and expelling and concentrating is there something fundamentally different about place and what you call the spaces of making, the spaces of the expelled? I would love when we pick up this discussion, if you could take a few minutes. And thank you for your wonderful talk. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. And thank you, of course, um, Saskia, for this um, very thought-provoking um, talk. I, I'm also really fascinated by your concept of expulsion because it captures um, almost the violence of um, those new forms of exclusion. And when I was reading your text and also listening to you now, I was thinking, how comes that international human rights has so spectacularly failed those who are expelled, the global poor? How comes that we actually have a system of international human rights law and yet there are people who are fighting for their bare life. And as you said, it's not actually something that is happening, you know, in a hidden place and um, torture chambers or anything. It's um, on a daily basis uh, we see it. It's everywhere. And um, so I think it's really important to identify um, this phenomenon and, and um, think about it more. Um, in the context of human rights, um, there are two issues um, that came to my mind. And the first um, relates to the interconnectedness of human rights. I think the fact that we have this market dominance everywhere has a lot to do with the fact that we come to tailor human rights, that we come to pick the ones we think are um, adequate. And that is actually um, very much the opposite of uh, what human rights has always been about. Um, from the very beginning in the UN, um, you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which um, has both civil and political rights, democratic rights, and social and economic rights. And it was only because of Cold War divisions that we actually ended up with two separate covenants. But after the end of the Cold War, this interdependence was again very much reaffirmed. And yet, there is this pervasive assumption that somehow we can just focus on one set, and if we get political institutions right, somehow everything else will magically follow. And I think we very much see that it doesn't. So um, the whole industry, really, that has built around democracy promotion somehow operates from the assumption that if we can um, create you know, good political institutions, then there won't be social exclusion, there won't be social inequality, and so on. And um, this is actually forgetting about looking at the way the other way around. Because can democracy ever function when there is this enormous inequality? So um, do we not maybe need to think more about um, the conditions that we create for, for citizenship to actually work. We assume that you know, we have citizenship and everything else will fall in place, and we think very little about what we need to do to make citizenship work. So I think um, taking human rights really in an integrated fashion could, um, could somewhat help. I was also very intrigued um, by the previous session um, which talked about um, democracy and outcomes and actually emphasized the open text texturedness of um, democracy. I think the assumption always that democracy brings positive outcomes, brings peace, brings economic justice um, is part of the problem. So I think really focusing on human rights in an integrated manner is, is probably um, an important fact. Um, the other thing um, which I think might contribute really to making human rights relevant again, relevant to this um, phenomenon of exclusion, relevant to, to, um, to an age of globalization, is 
to think more about the international dimensions. I mean, you did say at the beginning that, that these um, things really happen within our communities. But in the age of globalization, I do not think that we can ever really um, focus on any phenomenon you know, without thinking about the global context. So in that sense, I think you know, if, if I use your word, we need to destabilize human rights um, to some extent and go beyond the national framework where we simply think human rights is basically something that is happening in the relationship between the individual and the government and think more about it, how it is actually, um, how it applies globally. So the phenomenon of land grabbing, for example, could not, you know, could not be there if we actually took human rights seriously and took them seriously in the transnational dimension. And just as um, at the national level, I think the integration of civil and political rights and social and economic rights is important. So I think if we think about the international stage, we need, you know, we need both. We need a global dialogue about where globalization is actually going, how we are shaping the world. But in order for this dialogue to really you know, work, we need to also think about the inequality and, and close the gap. I mean, in the 1970s, we had this great attempt to have a new international economic order, and yet nothing came of it because simply um, the, the gap between developing and developed countries was too great. So, um, so my plea would be for greater human rights integration and, and um, taking a holistic approach um, rather than to actually pick and choose. respond, but I feel terribly guilty suddenly, imagine, uh, after speaking far too long. Um, I mean, you decide, because maybe... I think we would love to hear your response to both of these very helpful discussants. Okay. Now, both of you get at something. Thank you, by the way. Incredibly, incredibly helpful. You know, you've really added another dimension in the human rights. Bit. So, um, both of you uh, engage this localizing huh, that I and I'm and partly that localizing as as practice as research practice is uh, led by this notion of recovering the material side of it huh? I, I talk a lot about the material condition that which is visible and that then creates this problematic how can so much material stuff not be more visible, huh? more sort of that we just, and that is why these migrations, so-called, are very interesting. They make visible, and yet there were 7,000 floating in boats huh? in the Araban Sea. I mean, this is amazing stuff, actually. So it also tells us something about, if I wanted to use one kind of word, I could say the culture of this moment. You know, what we care, what is a dramatic thing, what is unacceptable. We have not always reacted like we do today to this. You know, with many different things. I mean, you know, so it's, these are just questions for me. Uh, now, the locality, then going back to this global dimension, see, the locality that I talk about is a manifestation. It's a material moment that I can go check out. But how it is generated is very much linked, of course, to global dynamics. There are global actors. Secondly, theoretically, I have long argued to, besides the self-evident global blah blah eh, that I also talk about, I have long argued that much of the global gets constituted deep inside the national, often dressed in the clothing of the national. The whole thing about about, uh, you know, um, what, what did we call it? The privatizing, the deregulating, etc. <coughs> to a very large extent, the corporations used national states, you know, either the executive branch of government, the legislatures, the, the to, so, so they, they actually, national, it looks like national policy, but if you go digging, it's not national policy. It is the interests, very often of corporates, eh? I mean, mind you, there are millions of corporations that are fine. I'm just talking about very large ones that are a bit damaging, so to speak, when I say corporates. Uh, 
so that is one thing that that a lot of the global including the global corporate global gets constituted nationally dresses itself in national clothing hence it's difficult to detect so for me that was a key arena that became a research site for me rather than looking at the self-evident global that doesn't interest me you know I mean there's a lot there's a lot of research about it tomorrow and the other thing is that then I ask myself the question again I'm always interrogating her how do those without power make a global condition and one way they do it is via recurrence not knowing not via communication. This is one of the issues that you must have picked up in my work on digital. You know, that the, the digital technology, say for interactive views, etc., is not just about communication. A lot of stuff can happen that does not depend on communication. It is much more than communication. And so I have studied activists of the environment and human rights activists in, in miserable situations, including like Mexico, you know, where you can't just go public. Huh? The fact that the internet exists has two functions. One is very rare. You have to upload the information, tortured body, whatever it might be, right? Because, and, and I must say that the big ones, you know, the glamorous zone, they have developed software that has facilities, very important, Oxfam and, and Amnesty International, you know? They don't do just luxury dinners, let's put it that way. And, and so that is one thing. The other one is subjective. Now, I may be wrong there, but it's the notion I'm not alone. There are others all over, you know, who are also engaging in this. And those people are often very alone. You know, they, they, there is, they often have to hide what they're doing. So that to me is an extraordinary power that an existing domain that they may have very little access to in their daily life still tells them that there is something, and that is a kind of globality, you know, that is extremely important so that these immobile people can actually experience themselves, you know. In a, so global for me is not just the self-evidently global. Now really, I think that we should, people want to eat, I want to have a drink, you know, I am on total jet lag, I'm about to collapse, you know, so I think, can I suggest maybe that we don't have questions? Is that reasonable or not? That's absolutely reasonable, and I think Gina would probably like to come back on some of the points that you've raised about technologies. Uh, thank you for being <laughs> the spot. <laughs> um, yes, I to, to echo what you've just said about the possibility of communication. I noticed one thing in your talk and one thing in your comment that you just said. The, the power to make machines. Who's making the things that make? And the things that make in this system are the platforms. And so my question, my, my kind of pushback to you on that always is the platform deeply matters for how we connect people, what kinds of systems we make, and who's making what off the platform. Yeah. So I have my latest project, I have to send it to you. Open, so open society, of all places. Oh my God, I hadn't even thought about the connection yeah. here. They're here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, you know, I, I did a bit of research on digital applications for low-income workers and how to transform the low-income neighborhood into a social backup system. Where you begin to, and that's just a first step, you begin to mobilize people. There are not many apps for low-income people, except consumer stuff, you know, that everybody's welcome to buy. And so, anyhow, I, I just finished that. I, I was very interested in that. Anything else? Just that I found the um, idea of physical evidence and visibility was really an important issue. And, and now that we had the bodies, I think the whole issue of Lampedusa has somewhat changed because once you have a physical site, it suddenly um, becomes the dynamic changes. That's right. 